Christians being involved in politics is a foreigner in many ways. And we want to thank God for Reverend Meshwe. We want to thank God that he speaks the truth to power and uh, he speaks for us, for the kingdom of God, whenever he takes the microphone in parliament. He speaks the biblical truth. He speaks biblical policies that are biblical and uh, the, the <clears throat> ACDP uh, may not be a ruling party, but it has represented the kingdom of God excellently uh, through Reverend Kenneth Bishop. And I would like you to give him a, a kingdom applause. Uh, Yes, we're not just praising him, he deserves it, because there are not many Christians that are in public office that their integrity has been intact. And how do you know that? You don't need to, to just listen to the press. The only thing that they will say against Reverend Meshia is go back to your church. <laughs> you know, just go back to your church. I mean, if there has been any kind of uh, misappropriation of funds or anything untoward, you know that the press will hammer it. And so we can give an example here that it is possible for a believer to be in public office, to speak truth to power, to represent the kingdom of God, not to lose their faith, and not to bow to corruption. One more time, let's give revelation. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to say a few words and to greet all the saints in the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, to our guests who come from Germany, we thank God for what we have learned from Germany and from Germans. Um, maybe just two things I need to say. Firstly, 
the issue of discipling nations is one of the biggest challenges facing the church. In Matthew 28, verse 18, there Jesus says, All authority, all authority, not some, but all authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto you. And because of this authority, you must go and make disciples of all nations. We have succeeded to a certain extent to make disciples of individuals, but not nations. And that should be our major, major goal. Um, and I personally think that Jesus is still waiting for this mandate to be fulfilled before he comes. We know that there are people who are praying for the rapture because of the many problems and challenges. Have you forgotten? They want to escape. They want to escape. They want to run away. And uh, with all uh, diplomacy and kind of ways we can use, we need to tell them to stop praying for the rapture. Because we need to pray for the fulfillment of that great commission that nations must be one for Christ. Now, if nations are one for Christ, there will not be a single area where the Lordship of Jesus Christ is not proclaimed, yeah. including yeah. where I am in government. Now, if we have that vision that every knee shall bow, every institution must have people who bow to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And it is our task, it is our responsibility to ensure that the Great Commission is fulfilled. The world needs leaders that are not ashamed of Jesus Christ. As we know what's happening in the world today, um, those who read other things except the Bible, because Christians should be informed. You know, Hosea the prophet said, my people perish for lack of knowledge. 1986 July, we attended a Billy Graham uh, conference for evangelists in Amsterdam, 1986. One thing that he said that I'll never forget. He said, with my left hand, I hold a newspaper to hear about the challenges and the problems in society. And with my right hand, I hold the Bible that has the answers and the solutions to the problems that are in the world. And he also said, you cannot solve problems you are not aware of. You cannot solve problems that you do not know. That is why Christians must know what is happening rather than putting our heads under the sand. Now, having said that, for South Africans, there is a, an invitation for South Africans to make submissions. I don't know whether you know about that and whether you have done that. Also, South Africans must do that because that's the submission that is, um, should be done, should be made by Christians, in particular, or all South Africans will assist us in ensuring that the fulfillment of what we know is prophecy, that uh, the lawless one is going to be revealed, the Antichrist is going to be revealed, even though the spirit of the Antichrist is in the world, but the lawless one, before he's revealed, the new world order, obviously, they want to take over the world. Okay? The new world order want to take over. Now, I have experiences. My work with God has taught me a number of things that I can confidently say to you that the Antichrist personally attempts to make him take over the world now is uh, they are ahead of their time. The church must first win the world, okay? Or maybe disciple the nations. I think that's more accurate. The church must first disciple nations, all right? In Matthew 24, 14, Jesus says, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole earth as a witness, and then the end will come. Something has to happen before the end comes. Because once the Antichrist has been revealed, the lockdown we are going to have, if those, some of us did not know, will be permanent. Okay? There were plans to have a permanent lockdown. In May, um, the World Health Organization is planning to amend their constitution. Okay? Amend their constitution so that they have powers. That when they say lockdown, they have authority and their authority is going to cause all uh, nations who were independent, who were sovereign, to lose their sovereignty. Okay, you might not know. Sovereignty of nations is under threat. 
That is why God's people must make an input and say, we are not ready for a takeover of the Antichrist because we have not yet fulfilled our mandate. We have not yet fulfilled our mandate. The last thing I can say, anybody who would say um, that is not, is that beyond us, we cannot control that. I would not agree with that person because Jesus said in Matthew 18, 18, okay, in the Good News Translation, whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. And whatever you prohibit on earth will be prohibited in heaven. So there is authority that is given to the body of Christ. Now, I have experience, I can tell you testimonies till the, the sun sets of what happens when people say we will not permit this thing to happen. Once you know the will of God, you stand your ground, you use the authority in Christ, and things can happen, and things are happening. So I'm just saying thank you very much for this time, but I'm saying Christians, South Africans, beware and wake up if you are not aware of what's happening and say, I'm going to make my own input and say, we are not going to lose our sovereignty to somebody in Europe. We are not going to do that because that's not God's plan. God is a God of nations. One world government, it's going to happen, but when is the question? And personally, I think it will happen when there are Christians who say, whatever, whatever happens may happen. But if people know the authority in Christ and they say, not now, wait, Satan has ears. Amen. Okay? As God has ears, Satan has ears. So, the Lord bless you and have a wonderful day. Thank you, friend. I'm going to ask Sigrid and a few of the leadership to pray for your family, if you don't mind. And uh, Sigrid, would you please come? And... Uh, a prayer of Kofri, uh, Dion and Daniel, uh, you can please surround Roman Asia and let's pray for his family. Father in heaven, we thank you for our dear brother, we thank you for his political position, for his spiritual position, and we bless you with the spirit of Daniel, who is serving a demonic system, and the Lord Nebuchadnezzar down on, to his knees, will they turn Nebuchadnezzar into the greatest evangelist of the Old Testament? He professed six or seven times that the God of Israel is the only God there is, and his kingdom will never end. And we, yes, we provide him with this authority to speak in Parliament and political machine of South Africa, exactly this message. And we proclaim that knees will bound. Every knee will bound. In politics and the central government and provincial government and the government of cities, everywhere, knees will bound because of your spirit and because Christians are praying in a faithful way until something happens. Amen. Uh, Father, I'd like to add to that as I give you thanks for this man of God, this father of the faith, this example of a believer, and for the many battles that he and his family have waged on, uh, on our part in the nation. I feel in my heart that you are very very proud of him and that you want him to know that you're proud of his labors and may he be encouraged in his heart may the Holy Spirit convey the heart of God and the encouragement of heaven to him and father we want to rise as people of South Africa and cancel every scourge of tongue against him. Where people have spoken carelessly, where people have given words for the enemy to use against him, where the enemy has raised witchcraft and sorcery against him, against his family. Father, we do not permit it. We do not permit it. 
we do not permit it. Can I ask you to please stretch your head? If you can stand, please stand and let's stretch our heads and pray that every witchcraft that is directed at Reverend Kenneth Meshua is widely there make sure that the church does not permit it. In the name of Jesus. Father, we pray in the name that is above every other name. And we frustrate and we cancel and we nullify every witchcraft and sorcery and divination and enchantment that the enemy has mobilized against this family. We break those arrows of darkness. We cause them to boomerang. In the name of Jesus, there is no enchantment against Jacob. There is no divination against the Mishra family. We cover them afresh in the blood of Jesus. And we speak strength, strength, strength to you, strength to your wife, strength to run this lap of the race, strength to proceed. We proclaim how beautiful on the mountains at the feet of them, at the feet of Kenneth Mishri and his wife, because they declare that Jesus is Lord among the nations. We make your feet beautiful, your face to shine again. We proclaim strength upon you from the body of Christ in this nation and from this capital city. We proclaim strength. Please, before I drop the mic, I want you to proclaim strength and grace to this. Grace. Grace, 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 grace for everything that God has shown you, for everything that God has spoken, for everything that God has committed into your hands. We proclaim grace, grace and strength in Jesus' mighty name. Father, we thank you for a faithful man. We thank you, Father, that we may ask that his example, Father, will be the DNA that you can replicate so that more men, more women, Father, in positions of power and politics will rise in this nation, willing to live a life dedicated to the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for this example. We thank you for the seed that has been sown over many, many years. And that many times, Father, he was a voice in the desert. Many times he stood as a lone voice, even standing in front of our presidents and speaking the truth to them when it's not popular for anybody to speak it. I thank you, Father, that the seed is in the ground. I thank you, Father, that I may ask that this season of his life will be the season of breakthroughs, the season, Father, where he will see the culmination and the answering of prayers that have been placed before you for many, many, many years. Thank you, Father, that you have seen the sacrifices where no man has seen. You have seen, Father, the willingness to serve you even to his own cost and his family's cost. No that he needs to obey his call and he needs to honor his master. And we praise you, Father, that we may ask that you will strengthen him just as Sifri prayed, like you did, Daniel, Father. Daniel kept going. Even though there was a new government four times, he was in it all the time. He was there. He was constantly the voice of the master. And I thank you, Father. I, I, I want to believe I had that picture when Daniel stood up and he had to go and read the, uh, what was written on the wall. And what he read there was a declaration of the Lord over those in authority that didn't honor God. And it feels to me, Father, that the season has come where Kenneth will speak and Kenneth will say, you have been found too light and therefore you will be removed. I ask, Father, that you will <clears throat> make him bold and I have that clear word that you gave to the prophet, I will make your head harder than the head of the opposition. You will be diamond-like and when they come against you, you will not be the one walking away with the damage. They will be the ones walking away with the damage. So come and strengthen our brother that he will be able to fulfill to the full in the mature state that which God ordained the day you called him, Father. We thank you that this nation has the privilege of a servant of God who brings this nation on his knees before the throne of heaven. 
And we ask, Father, that you will give him a, an army that will join him. You will give him a people that will strengthen him where you send him in as the arrow point, Father. And that he will not be weakened, but he will be refreshed. He will be refined. And he, Father, will honor his master. And he will have much joy in his heart for doing that. We pray for Lydia, Father. We ask, touch her body, touch her circumstances. She's also just as bold, Lord. What an amazing woman. She just does not keep quiet. She speaks the truth no matter who doesn't like it, Father. And we ask today, Lord, that, that your Holy Spirit will be a, a fresh fire on her, Father. Give them the fresh mantles for the season that we are in in this nation and in the nations of the world, that they will not stand back, but they will boldly represent their God and they will see God honor them. Legitimize them, Lord. Validate them by your Spirit, as you did your son when you said, This is my son. And whom I'm well pleased, do what he says. Come and stand behind him in such a way that others will recognize that this is a son of God, and we will honor God through what he brings us in Jesus' name. Father, I just um, want to bring this one more thing before you. And I want to pray into his legacy. I want to pray for his spiritual family. Lord, your word says that this blessing is for him, for his children, for his children's children, and even to a thousand generations. And I pray for this blessing to rest upon his children and every spiritual son that that you have um, given him, that they will receive this blessing and that this blessing will multiply in their lives, but also that the spiritual sons will multiply and that there will be a wave of righteousness to spread throughout the land. We pray for the seed that has been sown over the years. We pray for that seed to be ignited and to be growing fast. And we pray for the watering of the seed. We pray for the waters of the Spirit to come and to ignite the seed and to breathe life into the seed. And Father, we pray that these seeds will grow and become strong trees, trees of righteousness in the nation. We thank you, Father, for the work that you are doing in and through, through your servant. Will you bless him as your son today and his offspring. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. I think what is so wonderful is Reverend Kenneth Meshu that um, heaven will remember your input into this nation for many generations to come. I have no doubt about it. And partly of what we're going to speak about next is to look at the perspective from heaven. How God views the affairs of men and how we need to view the affairs of men, especially the interaction between nations. Um, over the years. So the next session, which God will really supernaturally have to help us with uh, for our timing, let me just get that. This session will be between me and Eberhard, uh, where we're going to talk about South Africa and its Christian legacy. And it's so important. I came to the understanding in, in the involvement that we developed, especially in Europe, that God showed us that we cannot grow kingdom processes until we do not know what the process is that has gone before. Because that is the foundations God has provided, that is what God provided us with in order for our generation to serve the kingdom fully. And we tend to, as modern people, live like islands and think we are all special, uh, that we are better than those that's gone before us and we're quite ignorant. And part of what we will unpack in this session is to have a view specifically to see what did Europe invest into South Africa, especially Germany, so that we can know about it, so that we can start reconnecting to it, celebrating it, and then start walking in the example of what it said for us in the kingdom. So the first thing I want to say is that we have to understand that God is sovereign in the affairs of men. God is sovereign in the affairs of men, and many Christians live as if Things are just happening by themselves and it's out of control. And Many Christians tend to pray quite fearfully. I get quite agitated being in the intercessory ministry and working with intercessors. When I see how much of the intercession that we produce is fear-based. How much of our so-called intercession is because we're so afraid. What's the devil doing? Oh, something terrible is happening. And we are living... As if God is not sovereign in control. Because we have such a small perspective of God. And until we do not develop the perspective of the kingdom and of God in who He is in His totality. Not just in the 
small snapshot of what we have of God, we will not be able to work in the kingdom in the way that we should. So God is sovereignly at work and in control of how He regulates the nations to fulfill His purposes. And in spite of the sinfulness and fallenness of man, His purposes are always <clears throat> done and brought forth. And that to me is so amazing. Uh, we look at the dream that God gave to Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 2. And to me this is one of the most astounding revelations that you find in Scripture. God gives this mighty, mighty king a dream. He doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't know what it means. And he uh, goes through a bit of manipulation to try and get somebody to give him information about his dream. And God touches Daniel. Daniel comes to him and Daniel explains to him that the dream that you saw was God revealing to you the most powerful king in the universe. Well, in, in, the, in the earth at that time, what the history of mankind will look like and where your place is in this history and what will follow you. And we all have read that where he talks about the different empires that will follow after Nebuchadnezzar. And then these amazing words that Daniel says in Daniel 2.45, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. This dream is certain. And its interpretation is sure. If there's anything that gives me confidence of how much God is in control, it is this prophecy. Because God gives Nebuchadnezzar a whole glimpse of all the empires that would follow after him until the day when all of the earth will be destroyed and replaced. The kingdoms will be replaced by the kingdom of God. You and I, we read that story and we go back to history to prove that it's true. But when Daniel prophesied it, there was not, it was only the golden head, the King Nebuchadnezzar that was in place. All of the rest of it was not yet even close in history. So if God could so in detail describe to Nebuchadnezzar what would follow in the nations, don't you think he's in control of every little detail? of how he works with our nation and with nations and the interaction that we have with nations. Long before it had happened, God revealed it. And it's time that we know that we do not serve a Mickey Mouse God. We do not serve a God that is impotent and small. We serve a God that is fully in control and fully at work. The question is, are we going to allow him to work through us so that his kingdom processes in the nations may be facilitated? God sent His messengers. Wherever we read in Scripture, He sent them with intentionality and purpose. God wasn't wondering what He was doing. And we must come to realize the, the wisdom and intentionality of God when He sends people, when He sends people to bring the gospel to the, a continent and to a nation. And it's very difficult to look at the history of Africa and even the history of South Africa because we are so influenced, and Shagan will talk about it, by a perspective that is secular, that is political, that is not God's perspective. And we have to understand it was not a mistake that God sent the Europeans to Africa. It was not a mistake. It was intentional. It was not a mistake when God sent the German missionaries to South Africa. He knew exactly what he was doing. And if we cannot see that, we cannot start walking in the processes that needs to go forward. We see how God positioned Philip in Acts 28 to go and share the gospel with the Ethiopian Enoch. It's beautiful, Acts 8, 26. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, Arise and go forward toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. An angel appeared. God sent the angel. The angel says to Philip, this is exactly where you need to go. Go to this road. And because of his obedience, he shares the gospel with a man that takes it back to the nation of Ethiopia. And the gospel reaches Africa. God was in it fully from the beginning. We look at Paul's life. And it's so interesting in Acts 16. When, now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Wow. Lord, doesn't the Asians also need the gospel? Of course they do. But my, I have a very specific plan. I know what I'm doing. Paul, you're not going east. You're going west. You have to go to Europe. God knew what he was doing when he hindered Paul. 
when he gave him a clear instruction and forbade him from trying to share the gospel in another direction. Because in the plan of the unfolding of the kingdom, that was not what was on the cards. Because God sees everything and knows everything. And then in verse 9, we just read where God gives him the right instruction. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Can you see how much in control God was about where Paul was supposed to go? Paul stated that God hindered them the one way and opened the door for them the other way. God clearly ordained that Europe first had to receive the main thrust of the gospel message. And his plan was clear to spread the message from there. This was no coincidence. This is what God did. God was at work. With the peace and infrastructure of the Roman world, the gospel could effectively fill the continent and build a basis from which God could then later bring explorers into the rest of the world so that the gospel could be taken to the rest of the world. There's a reason why we were not evangelized by China. Think about it. It wasn't God's mistake. God knew exactly what He was doing. And He knew exactly what He was building into a continent to make them the basis from which the world could be reached by the gospel. Can we see that? Will we understand that in the fullness of time, God works in order to bring the gospel to people that, that do not have it? And these messengers offered so much to our benefit. It's time that we recognize the life we receive from our European spiritual fathers. It's not that they are special. It's that God understood their gift is in His hands. The special gift that would bring all of us the ability to receive the gospel. They contributed so much. They sacrificed so much. It cost them so much. And I wish we had time to go into these sacrifices that people made. Because I think we need to hear it. More and more because we need to be called to their example. Where there was England, France, Germany, Scotland, America, there's so many nations that invested into our nation so that we have the gospel today. We are a rich nation spiritually. I don't know if you know that. I've traveled a bit over the world. I can tell you, we are rich spiritually. We're not there yet, but here is an openness for God. There are many people that serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Spiritually, the heavens are open here. Whenever we have Europeans coming to South Africa, they say, it's so light here. It's so easy here to have contact with the Lord. Where we come from, we feel oppressed. We are privileged. And it's not because we did it or we are special. It's because we received the gospel sacrificially from other people. So Yebarat will come and share with you a bit of the German story that he has researched. If you remember that little booklet you got within your packet is the research that he did. We're just going to tell you a bit of the German investment into South Africa so we can start awakening you to that sacrifice that was brought. I will share a bit about some French things in between. Of course, there is so little time. I think can the team also come and sit in the front row that you see them and know they can share more. Uh, Serena, Christine, your On 31st October, somehow God showed us, listen to the Moravian Brass Band Festival. And because I learned so much, I want to be a teacher also, so I'll ask difficult questions. 31st October, a show of hands, does that date mean anything to you? Anyone? Okay. Germans know it. Anybody else? Yes. Give us the date. Correct. Correct. On that 31st October, we couldn't believe it. The Moravians all over South Africa celebrated their heritage. And just listen what we heard on that day. Thank 
because of COVID, they couldn't eat. But all over the country, not only the music impressed us, but the precision, the wonderful technology. stations that were created when we are joyful we rejoice with the sounds of brass and when we are mourning we find comfort in the sounds of brass Discovery. After a day or two, we said we are on a journey to the soul of our nation, and I want you to come with us on this journey. We started in the Eastern Cape and ended in Mamre on the Western Cape to discover this heritage that was placed in this nation 300 years ago. And the unbelievable thing is, it started in a village called Helmhut, a village where God had a plan, and a village that links to Count Senzudorf that Siegfried spoke of. In this village, two Reformation streams came together. It's on the corner of three countries, Poland, Germany, and the present Czechoslovakia. And there, a stream from Moravia in Czechoslovakia, an older Reformation stream, Johann Hus followers, came as refugees. They were chased by the Catholic Church and they met a Lutheran stream under Count Sinsendorf and on his estate in this village, he said, you brothers, come join us. Let us brothers be together. God led us in 2019 to this village. We wanted to be there, but we could not get a contact. Why? Because on the day we wanted to be in Herrenhut, there was a wedding. And in this village, everybody is at the wedding. So we couldn't go. But we had, through a South African pastor, a flat in the neighboring village. And we went. And the night before, we phoned three people again in Harrowwood. Can we meet? And the second one said, early in the morning in the bakery, I have time for you. So we met him over breakfast. But within an hour after we prayed together, all eight were invited to the wedding that was the bottleneck before him. And so Harrowwood, to us, started a journey. And our contact the leader of Jesus House and International House of Prayer in Harrenwood took us into the forest and symbolically he showed us a new spring that the girl had discovered was breaking out in Harrenwood. And I've got a picture of Leon praying at that spring. And later we heard, even in Moravia, in Czechoslovakia, in big cities in Germany, in Dresden, they are hoping the revival will again start in this village. Let me share how revival came about. You heard about Count Sintendorf on the left. Uh, look at the dates. The meeting of these two streams was 1722. A bit of arithmetic, 300 years ago. And in our final session, you will hear, Herrenhut is calling the nations that were impacted by it to celebrate this meeting of two Reformation streams. 
The meeting was between a count and a carpenter. The carpenter came from Arabia, a refugee. But this meeting, under the umbrella of the Lord of Lords, brought a global mission movement from a small village. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. But how beautiful both these men loved the Lord. They were both hymn writers. If you take a Lutheran hymn book, you will find 10 or 15 hymns from Count Sensendorf. But the carpenter, Christian David, was also a hymn writer, a love, a love for Christ. 1722, remember that date. Also beautiful, we remember people like this traveling on the M6 in Cape Town to Musenberg, you pass the Christian David Primary School. The Moravians remember their history. Christian David didn't even come to South Africa. He became a missionary to the Red Indians in America. Still is remembered in our nation. Now I want to share a bit of history that you can't find in history books because there's only each mission society shares its own history. So we have to piece it together. The Moravians were the first. 1722, the gathering of the two Reformation streams. Five years later, Zinsdorf managed to bridge language and cultural differences. They started praying together and the Holy Spirit first touched the 12-year-old and then the whole group. Five years later and 10 years later, they already started to go to many places, Suriname, Australia, but 10 years later, 1737, the first missionary came to South Africa. And starting from the Cape, they covered the coastal area up into the Eastern Cape. So they were the first, but there were more to come. The Rhenish mission, Rhenish mission, came to the Cape they were helped initially by the London Missionary Society uh, and they helped to establish stations under their name which they later took over. A station right up on the border with a place that was not even called Southwest Africa, Bethany. And from that station the Rhenish went into Southwest Africa, missionized the Nama people and the Herero brought the written language, brought the Bible to that nation. Southwest Africa is a Christian nation through this investment. Also the beautiful Pumatal near Cape Town was created by the Rhenish missions, later taken over by the Moravians. Let's take the next group, the Berlin mission. Let me get the date there. Uh, 18, from 1836, they started in Natal, in the British colony, and then helped the Helens Book Mission to establish first in Natal, and then going into Zululand. And I'll share a bit more. From there, they were invited by the Boer Republics, who didn't like, for some reason, the English missionaries. So, that's how the German missionaries came there and from there even went into Bechuana land. And just to say, today we're celebrating the German missionary heritage, but there is so much more. And Leon just wants to make us aware of the European heritage. Okay, we have been working in France since 2020, uh, since 2001. So for 21 years we have invested into the nation of France. And I would just like to share a little bit just the impact that the French had as a nation on our country in different ways. The first way was the fact that many, many Afrikaners were descendants of French Huguenots. I don't know if you know your Huguenot history, 
Many Afrikaners know they have Huguenot blood, but I don't know if they know who the Huguenots were and what they went through. But the Huguenots had a major impact on who the Afrikaner is today. A lot of the characteristics that the Afrikaner has is thanks to what the Huguenot French forefathers lived and believed. Even Andrew Murray, when he worked amongst the Afrikaners, said they were God-fearing people and he recognized it was because they were descendants of the French Huguenots. So the first thing is, for us that have uh, Huguenot forefathers, uh, Afrikaner blood that come from the French side, uh, firstly the French were call, called, or the Huguenots were called les gens de la parole, the people of the word. They had a passion for the word of God, and they had a passion to read the word of God. Um, it was illegal to read the word of God in those years, because the Catholic Church said nobody was allowed to read the Bible. The Bible was only supposed to be in Latin, and only a priest was allowed to interpret the word for somebody else. But the Huguenots decided that they needed to know the word in their own language and taught it to their children. It was a pride for a young boy or a young child. Um, the Huguenot children could read much earlier than most uh, of their uh, Catholic counterparts because their parents taught them to read from the Bible. And they knew that if they could read, the first gift that they would get is their own Bible because that would be uh, the reward that the, the Protestant parents would give them as a child that could read, he could get his own Bible. So they really loved the Word of, the word of God. They had a very good work ethic that also came from the Protestant faith and the understanding of the Bible. Made them very productive and hard working, causing them to be competition to others around them, which others were not happy about. They were really a people that were purified because they went through many years of persecution. When you get persecuted, you get purified in your faith. You get tested. Do you really serve God? What are you serving? Are you willing to suffer for, for the kingdom? And they were totally unwilling to recant their faith. They were willing to lose everything in order to keep Jesus Christ. And many of them and most of them did lose everything. They lost their land. They lost their buildings. They even lost their children. The Catholic Church came and took their children, put them into convents, took them away from their parents because they were not willing to recant. The men was placed on galley ships, which was a death sentence because the galley ships belonged to the king when he warred. And they say even when those ships started sinking, they would loosen all the other slaves that were rowers for those ships. But they would not loosen the Huguenots because they wanted them to drown and die because they despised the non-Catholics. And the women were locked up in prison. And there's a wonderful story of a woman with the name of Marie Durand who was in prison for 37 years. She, all she had to say is, I convert to Roman Catholicism. And she would be out of there. 37 years, she said, I will not say those words. I will not give up my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So those people then came to South Africa, a very small group of Huguenots, Many months on ship, many of them died, got sick on the ship, came into wild Africa with wild animals and, and locals and people that uh, uh, they didn't understand into a foreign land with a foreign government, which was Dutch at that stage, and they were had a mark, marked influence on who the uh, Afrikaners became later years because that faith was transmitted. Then we also found out one of the most beautiful stories, I think, gospel stories in South Africa is that the Basutu nation was evangelized by French evangelical missionaries. And it took us a while to get to know this and I don't think many people knows this. Three young men came from Paris that wanted to be missionaries in Africa. And the story is that towards the end of 1832, Adam Krotz, a hunter coming from the mission station, at Philippolis, established by the London Mission Society, went into Mushesh's country, King Mushesh, Mushesh uh, of the Basutus, and he, um, the king then called for Adam Krotz and said, I want to speak to you. And the, the king had a meeting with this Pequa guy, and he said to him, tell me how to gain peace in this troubled land. The king was tired of war. Your, and he said to Adam Krotz, your community is free from incursions. Perhaps it's because you have guns. Can you not get us some guns? 
And Adam Krotz replied, no, there is something better than guns. We have servants of God among us who teach us to live well and to shun evil. Our enemies, the Coronas, hold them in fear and trouble us no more. That is what you want, King Meshwesho, not guns. And then the king asked, what would be the possibility to have men, these men of peace, come to him? He says, do you know any of who would be willing to come? And he asked eagerly, the first you meet, tell them to come quickly. I will receive them with all my heart, the king said. Adam Crox departed. He took with him a herd of some 200 cattle that the king sent with him as a gift to, to send one of these missionaries to them. The cattle was stolen. He sent another 200. They were stolen. But Adam Crox never forgot, forgot what the king asked him. When he returned to Philippopolis, these three young French missionaries just arrived in South Africa to come and evangelize. Um, and they said, we will go. If this invitation has come, we believe it is an Acts 16 invitation like Paul received from the Macedonian man. Let us go. And three young missionaries with the names of Eugene Kassavis, Thomas Arbusse, and Constant Gozana made themselves available to go and meet with the king. Eugene Kassavis, I think, was about 20 years old. When he arrived amongst the Basutis, they said to him, go back home and send your parents. You don't talk to children. He was a young, young man willing to come to Africa for the gospel. And I just want to read this piece for you. They then had their meeting with the king in the stronghold of Basu, 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 and uh, through the medium of Prophet Kassalis explained their intention and promised that the chief should agree they would settle amongst the Basutus and share their fate, whatever the fate of the Basutu people may be. And then we read so beautifully where King Meshweshwe said, My heart is white with joy. Stay with us. You shall teach us. You shall do what you wish. The land is at your disposal. And the counselors agreed. And the missionaries then um, was advised Given land where they started the first missionary station was called Moriah, now called Morija in Lesotho. Um, and Meshwesha said, It is enough for me to see your clothing, your arms, and the rolling houses in which you travel, to understand how much intelligence and strength you have. I have been told you can help us. You promise to do it? That is enough for me. And they opened their hearts for these three missionaries. And I just want to share what the influence and impact was of these missionaries. It was beautiful that um, Kassalis, Eugene Kassalis became beloved by the king. The king really loved this young man. He was even given the privilege to sleep at the king's feet on the mat at the king's feet, which was given to the most privileged person in the tribe. And this young Kassalis became God's instrument, not just to evangelize, but became God's instrument into the decision making that the king needed. And we had the wonderful opportunity in 2007 to have an audience with the king of present king of Lesotho with some French visitors that we had. And as, we, as the king shared with us, he had tears in his eyes and he said to us, I praise God for the French nation. And he cried. And we were quite shocked. Why is this man praising God for the French nation? He says, because if it was not for the French missionaries, this nation would not exist today. And then he told the story that when King Meshwesha was really worried because he was fighting wars on the east and the west. The Boers were taking his land from the Free State side. He was being attacked by the Zulus from the other side. He was losing his country. This missionary came to him and says, why don't you go to the English and ask to be an English protectorate? And that decision saved the nation and caused the nation to still exist today. He says, I would have not had a nation to rule if it was not the advice. So Cassidy's was really... Uh, like a de facto uh, minister of uh, foreign affairs. And he nearly never took decisions without first speaking to Kassanis in the decisions that needed to be made. So the continued existence of the Basutu nation is because of the French missionaries. It was the end of cannibalism in Lesotho. I don't know if you know, there was cannibalists in Lesotho. So the first schools were open, learning. They were learning to, they learned to read and write because of the investment of the missions, the first time that the Sutu language was written down, the spiritual and religious life. Even today, the Basutu people are very religious. 
if you go to the city, they are re religious people because of the investment of the French missionaries. The word of God became available in Suti. They wrote Suti hymns and songs, and it's even beautiful. There are hymns in Le Suti where they thank God for the French missionaries that came and changed their nations. They were the first ones to put up printing presses and started producing material, the songs in Suti. They taught them farming and other technologies. And so this was a major discovery for us to realize that the Basutis and the Afrikaners have the same spiritual parents. That we have received the same faith from the same people group. And that to be a descendant spiritually of somebody is even more powerful than being a descendant just physically. And so we've had the privilege to take Basutis with us to France to together go and minister to our spiritual parents in France and to remind them of the investment they made and what we have to do. And I want to finish off, I, uh, I'm trying to get into my time. We had a French couple with us, a French pastor and his wife, but when we were amongst the Basutis and the Suti and we prayed with them, and I don't know if you've ever prayed with the Basutis, they make a noise, they are alive. They pray. And you know, the Europeans are not that uh, loud. And as they stood there and they heard these Basutis praying, she started crying and she shared with us afterwards, she said, you know, our nation has lost the flame of the gospel. But I've come to the southern point of Africa and I'm amongst the people and as I stood here, God said, do you see this fire? This is the fire that you used to have in your nation. Take it and take it back to France because the people of France need this fire again. So we have to understand that we have so many spiritual riches because of what Europeans invested into us. Can we see about And that was just one European nation. There are a number of others. But I want to share the beginning. Zinzendorf heard on the journeys around the Cape that the Khoi people were treated so badly and he said, Dear Schmidt, you go there and you preach the gospel to this honorable nation. And so Georg Schmidt arrived 1737. And here's a picture of five years later baptizing the first boy. But the Dutch Reformed Church from the Netherlands on the Cape didn't like this very much and they complained with the governor uh, that the bells in this mission station are ringing a bit too loud they can hear it in Stellenbosch uh, and so Georg Schmidt was sent back to Germany and then the beauty I wish uh, York could share it, he'll share it with you over tea 50 years later Yerkeshmit was sent home. Three missionaries from the same Arabian mission from Herrenhut were allowed back to the Cape. And they thought, we'll start again. But an old lady was brought to them. Every Moravian knows her name. Magdalena, they call her Lina. Came with a few followers, her disciples. She had carried on the work of Georg Schmidt. This Bible that Georg Schmidt left with her is still in the museum in Fanadina. What a beautiful, beautiful evidence. But also the evidence of the first African disciple, Lena, every Moravian knows about. Just to think how amazing what happened in this village with the power of the Holy Spirit coming. They went into the whole world. When I shared with a friend, Roland Schulz, our experience, he said, but my grandfather was in Labrador, also from Herrenhut, among the Eskimos, going to all the world. That was their mission. So here is a Hebron in Labrador. But the sad story is there is no more heritage, just a museum. And that tells us how important, 
our South African heritage is, which is still alive. We must cherish it and grow on that flame that is still burning in our nation. On our journey, we started in Shiloh, maybe a show of hands, where in South Africa is Shiloh? Let's see. It's necessary to know about our heritage. Shiloh, we obviously also didn't know, but we went to the website of the Moravian Church and we found telephone numbers and WhatsApp numbers. Nobody answered, but we drove there and we were wonderfully, wonderfully received. And just a name, Reverend Indabambi. He is not a Khoi. The Khoi nation were first evangelized in Thanardendal. But the Khoza people in the Eastern Cape heard about it. They came to Thanardendal and said, you must come to us. That is why one of the most uh, next mission stations was in the East. Shiloh is near Queenstown. And today, Shiloh is still a small place, but it's a Christian community. They're not all Moravians, but every leader, every community leader, every agricultural leader we met was a Christian. And it was so beautiful, they made the first wine in the Eastern Cape. And it's so new that they never had tourists yet, so they brought out the first bottle of Nkosi Pinotage and we shared it with them. The joy, each one just a small glass, but we had 15 minutes of just joy and laughter, Nkosi Pinotage. Nkosi means Lord Kings. So, this is so amazing the legacy of what was planted 300 years ago is alive. Every community leader is a Christian and they profess their faith. The next station is Clarkson. Again, a show of hands. Where does the name Clarkson come from? Any idea? The history of slavery is very important in our heritage. And Thomas Clarkson was a British parliamentarian who fought for the abolition of slavery. And here in this mission station, his name is still remembered. Yeah, five minutes. Thanks very much. I haven't learned yet from Shaker to steal a few more, a few more minutes. But just this wonderful, we met community leaders and a new young lady pastor named Reverend Chandra. Reverend Chandra. And in the evening at the candlelight dinner, everything happened. Every day we didn't know where we would be, what we would eat, where we would sleep. But there we had dinner with two core community leaders and Reverend Chandra. And then we prayed after dinner. What did Reverend Chandra pray? She prayed against the abuse of women and children, also in the Moravian settlements. She prayed for the gospel to reach dark Germany. A prayer in Mission Station Clarkson. She prayed for revival in Harrogate. Isn't that amazing how the heritage is remembered? A leader in the Khoi community, Lloyd, prayed for the word to find its rightful place again. Isn't that beautiful? And another community leader, an elder in the church, Jerome, for gratitude to come back. Don't mention off, and he got done by it. And suddenly, we all sang and clapped, read your Bible, pray every day. I think Christine will remember that too. Then we came to Genadendal and we were so amazed. The church inside is just like the church in Herringwood. So again, a part of, Her of 
heritage that we have to cherish. And we went back uh, at the Cape Town seminar two days before to Gernardendal. And what a blessing, even though we were only maybe eight or ten on our prayer visit there, they brought out the brass band and that evening we sat with some Arabian church leaders and listened to the brass band and the preparation for the Easter service the coming Sunday. But it was not only the Cape, it was also among the Zulu, and this was the most challenging for the Hermannsburg mission. Why? Because the Zulus were suspicious of every white man. On the one side the Boers were pushing, on the other side the British were pushing. So a few German missionaries really struggled, and then in the end the Anglo-Zulu Boer War broke out, and most of the German mission stations were burned down in the process, but they carried down. And today you'll find many of the names of villages in Zululand are the old mission station names. And at the same time, those Germans didn't only bring missionaries, they also brought tradesmen, people who were carpenters, people who were shoemakers that could teach a new community that was created. So that's so beautiful. We learned the trades, we learned to read and write as those missionaries established communities among the Zulus. And today, the Zulus are a Christian nation. That is their majority. In 1824, the Hermannsburgers translated the Bible into Zulu. There was already a pre-Bible by the Americans in Zulu, but many, if I get to that, many other Bibles of our nations in South Africa were brought by Germans, by translations. Something I never knew, our own, the old Transvaal, is covered by mission stations. Those are, again, the Hermannsburger and the Berliner Mission who were called by the Boer Republics to the Free State and to the Transvaal. And stations like Hebron, Jericho, Dino Kana were established. And I met missionaries to a young lady who is with us today, her parents, missionaries, and they uh, made known to me others and they brought me to a church in Acacia. Started in a garage in Pretoria North. In the end, five years later, they were so grown in numbers that they bought a Dutch Reformed church. The Afrikaners moved out of the area. People came from the homelands, Bukitotswana, a thriving church. When the brass band and the organ played, I cried. I know all those hymns in German, and here I heard them in Swana, our heritage. There's another wonderful heritage near Middleburg, a place called Bocciabello, which is falling into pieces, completely forgotten, a land claim gone wrong, which never should have happened. Uh, there's no one looking after this place, which is a second Fernandendal, there was a teacher training college. All that has gone to pieces because we haven't respected our heritage. That's a map that Leon produced that you show how at how many places. Wonderful in Mambra, the Reverend left us with the prayer sisters and so beautiful. Koi people and their descendants. Praise and worship is their prayer. When they sing, they close their eyes because they, they pray. They don't want any other disturbance. And here we met these prayer ladies. So I want to close. That you still must know. 
When our first president heard about Gnadendal, he decided to change the name of his Cape Town residence from, I think, Westrup to Gnadendal. Isn't that an acknowledgement of the wonderful, wonderful heritage we have? Today, the word missionary is almost a swear word in Germany, but it is associated with all the other bad things. And I just want to read you the spirit with which the missionaries came. Hermann's book missionary Theodor Hahn said, Never forget that you are Lutheran missionaries and have undertaken to teach according to Lutheran confession and using pure Lutheran sacraments. And never forget that you are Germans and must cling to German language and tradition as a jewel given you by God. And as Hermann's book missionaries, you may never become lords, must remain servants. That spirit is pulled apart today by theologians and politicians, but it was a spirit that God brought. And in closing, something to take forward. Isaac Barley, the leader of the Koi community establishment of the museum in Fernandal, he said, to respect our past and thus know with all confidence and no ignorance which way to go. Jesus is the portion of my inheritance. I, I want to appreciate uh, Eben for the last presentation. And I want to thank you very much for uh, making this conference a reality for me. You came to my house a couple of times to actually make sure that, you know, we get organized for this conference. And I want to thank you for this research uh, that you've done. It's going to be referenced in many ways. Um, <clears throat> this session is about um, Europe and Africa relations, eternal perspective. And it is my desire, my prayer that Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I am free now. Yeah. You're just used to certain things that they perform. So, this session is about Europe and Africa relations, eternal perspective, and I pray that we will end this session with a prayer, an investment of prayer uh, that reflects a new attitude, a new future between Europe and Africa. I want to believe that I represent a generation of Africans uh, that is not bitter. Uh, because if you are bitter, you lose the opportunity to be better. Actually, the Lord began to lay it on my heart, and some of you may have heard me say this before, uh, more than a decade ago, that God began to say to me that one of the reasons why your continent is not progressing is because you have not appreciated the kingdom labels of the spiritual fathers and mothers who started schools, who started hospitals, and started churches in your communities. And some of those communities, the younger generation is not even prepared to go there to work and to labor. But these missionaries went to the interior. He said, you can observe that none of those communities have been able to improve on the services that the missionaries render. So he says, so you're not making progress because you misunderstood my kingdom agents. 
You did not treat them the way that you were supposed to treat them. So you did not collect from them the kingdom battle so that you could actually develop your territory. And uh, I want us to, to meditate around that because this is not just about Pretoria, this is not just about South Africa, this affects every community in Africa. <coughs> that the missionaries open the door not just to evangelize but for development. And that we've misunderstood them. And by the time we went to school and we were taught a lot of humanism and secularism, we joined the politicians to say that, you know, uh, Europe colonized Africa and we, you know, put the baby and the bathwater together in Europe. And we want to hate them and to throw them away. And I believe that that is an attitude that is hindering the continent from moving forward. That is why I said, I believe that I represent a generation that is not bitter. Each time God has given me the opportunity to go to Europe, I start my first session by appreciating that they sent missionaries to us. And uh, some of you will remember in one of the new wine conferences that we held uh, about a decade in Pretoria here, we focused on appreciating the missionaries that went out of South Africa into the other parts of Africa. And we had special gifts for them. And uh, some of them who could not make it through the session, Rachel and I went to visit them in their homes to express our gratitude. Uh, for their labors in Africa, and uh, we were well received. But after I did that, I thought I had obeyed the Lord in terms of appreciating the missionaries. But the Lord had a different idea. He thought, well, what you did was good, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. It's a token that you did. And as if God wanted to illustrate to me what he was saying, he took me to Papua New Guinea, and uh, one of these days, I'll give you a full report of the mission that uh, 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 Ruben and I had in Papua New Guinea. It was amazing. Uh, both Ruben Baga and I were amazed at the quality of the repentance of the people of Papua New Guinea, how they organized themselves into tribes and clans, and uh, everything that we have in the books, they already they have in their heart, they put it into practice, and they took like an hour to repent for each, the clans repenting for their sins, and they came in sackcloth and ashes, confessed murder things that no prosecutor on earth must sit in that meeting, no lawyer, you <laughs> know. I mean, they, they brought everything open before the Lord. But that's not what I want to share. What touched my heart was that an Australian missionary uh, uh, risked his life to go to a place called San Meridi. That is where the conference was positioned in Papua New Guinea. And uh, this Australian missionary risked his life, you know. And I, I, I still don't know the extent of what he did, but all I know is that 50, 60 years later, this conference is still part of the fruit of his labors. And what the Papua New Guineans, the San Berigians, did was they invited the son of this missionary to that conference as a speaker as well. And when he came to a particular point, they went and fetched him and took him out of his vehicle and they carried him on their shoulders and carried him over kilometers to the conference and they started telling him how the investment of their father in their community changed their life. They confessed all the attempts that they made to murder his father publicly they confessed the attempts they made to murder him as a child. 
and they brought so many things to the open. And this boy, this man now was in tears. He, till the end of that conference, he could not preach. He was in tears. He was just weeping. And I think after I left that conference, the Lord began to, 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 to paint the picture of what Africans need to do to appreciate our spiritual heritage and to collect the battle from the missionaries who opened the interiors of Africa for the gospel and for development. And I brought that before the Lord. I said, now I understand. I said to the Lord, now I understand what I believe African communities need to do to appreciate the missionaries who risk their life to, to bring the word of God and to open our interiors for development. And the Lord said, you still don't understand. So the Lord added two more things to it. He said, what I'm asking you to do is key to revival in Europe. As much as it is key to your own development. He says, the path for your development I've already told you. But I want you to know that uh, Europe is backslidden. And they despise the labors of the missionaries that came to Africa. And they despise me through that as well. So you remember last night I was talking about the fact that God takes it personally, whatever you do with the missionaries. He takes it personally. And he says, I want you as African communities to prepare tokens from your various communities and send it to these families as a memory so that the families of the missionaries will know that the labors of these missionaries in Africa was not in vain. That it is actually me who took that offering from them. And that they can celebrate these missionaries more than they celebrate their scientists, their inventors, and in the various families where they have, um, uh, they have sent a missionary to Africa, they can know that God acknowledges it and that God owes them a reward. Okay, so I am writing down my notes and I am sharing a part of it with you that I believe that one of the ways that God is going to unlock development in Africa is for us to sit as communities, as coastal communities, as petty community, as a Zulu nation, and ask ourselves, what is it that European missionaries what contribution have they made to the development of our community? And can we prepare a special package, a plaque, a clothing, something special to us that we can send, certainly not consumables, that we can send to these families and if possible we can connect with them or we can send it by courier whichever way and we can let God and these people know that we actually appreciate the labors of love of this missionary. So that is a burden that is on my heart that I'm sharing with you. And I do hope and believe that some of you will pick this up. Because as sons and daughters of God, we are not supposed to be telling the devil's story. We're supposed to be telling God's stories. Amen. And the moment that we pitch ourselves with the devil's stories and repeat those stories, we begin to contribute to the darkness in the land. But when we tell the stories of what God has done, 
Because whether God has used a Caucasian or an African to do the work, it is God's work. And if we do not appreciate the messenger, we're saying to God, you made a mistake. And God never makes a mistake. He never does. And uh, I believe that uh, our story can be wrapped up in that story in First, First Chronicles. Uh, let me read that scripture and then I will go through my note very quickly because I really want us to pray. It's in First Chronicles chapter 19. I read a couple of verses. You can read the whole story at your own leisure. It says, It happened after this that Nahash, the king of the people of Ammon, died, and his sons reigned in his place. Then David said, I will show kindness to Anand, the son of Nahash, because his father showed kindness to me. So David sent messengers to comfort him concerning his father. And David's servants came to Anon in the land of the people of Amnon to comfort him. And the princes of the people of Amnon said to Anna, Do you think that David really honors your father because he has sent comforters to you? Did his servants not come to you to search and to overthrow and to spy out the land? Therefore, Anun took David's servants, shaved them, and cut off their garments in the middle and their buttons, and sent them away. And the story goes on. Instead of exchange of pleasantries of kindness, war started. Uh, you know, the people of Ammon went and talked to Syrians and uh, got, you know, weapons and they pitched a, 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 a battle against David and David did to them what he did to other people that he fought against. Uh, but initially, it, they, David did not have a heart of fighting and decimating the people. David had a heart of kindness and love. The people misinterpreted the message and it changed the whole history. And I am asking myself, in our uh, 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 Africans and various communities may have thrown away the baby with the bathwater. How we may have mistreated Europeans who came to our communities and preached the gospel and how God may be taking it personally. Like I said to you last night, God said to the disciples, wherever you are rejected, shake the dust of your feet. It will be worse for such places than for Sodom and Gomorrah. And you can look at some of our communities in Africa today, and you can actually say that it is worse. It is worse than Sodom and Gomorrah because it's a living hell. It's a living hell. The devil just comes there to do whatever he wants to do. So I'm saying that we need to have an eternal perspective in terms of our relationship with Europe. And I want to define what is eternal perspective. Eternal perspective combines the past the present and the future plus. So eternal perspective is not human. It's God's perspective. Eternal perspective is not about the past. It's not about the history as written by the historians, the chroniclers, because no matter how hard the historian tries, History has a challenge with objectivity. It can only be told from the angle of the writer. <laughs> and we need to ask God's own view, God's own perspective. And we should not be locked or imprisoned in that past. We should know that God has a complete picture. We shouldn't just accept it the way the Father has told it. We should rather, as children of God, ask God, what is your own perspective about that same story that my father and my, the politicians told me? 
And it's also not about the present. It's, 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 it's uh, beyond that. I am learning that God does not relate with people primarily on the basis of where they are coming from or on the basis of where they are. God relates primarily on the basis of where he is taking you. Because he has an end in view. So you shouldn't allow yourself to be defined by the past. You shouldn't even allow yourself to be defined by the present. You should rather ask God, where are you taking me as an individual? Where are you taking us as a people? Why did you send people from those places to come and speak to us? And I will speak more about this in the next session. Now, eternal perspective means that you conclude that God is good. And that all the time, God is good. Eternal perspective means that you accept that God's ways are not your ways. That God's ways are higher than your ways. And that you are not set in your own ways as a people. Mm -hmm. But you are allowing God to reveal his own ways to you. And that as a child of God, as a son and daughter of God, you are allowing God to fulfill that Psalm 67 that we read last night through you. So that the ways of God may be known to your people. You are a kingdom agent. Eternal perspective means that you see things the way God sees them. You don't see things the way uh, the world, the way the devil, the way you know a secularist wants to see them. You have God's perspective. Eternal perspective means that you also know that all things work together for good according to, if, if you are called according to God's purpose and if you love it. And I want to wrap up that session by, you know, telling you something that, you know, I, I observed with my dad. Now, this is a picture of my dad. He died 20 years ago at the age of 77. And, uh, yeah, 20 years ago at the age of uh, 77. And he was a chief. This is the only picture that I have now. He was an headmaster and a lay preacher. And he was also a chief. I'm telling you that because now, as a young boy, I observed many people come fighting you know, and bringing the conflict to my dad. And there is something that I observed that I have not liked, because my dad had such patience, he would listen to all of this. Some of them come, you know, occasionally with some, you know, threatening weapons. But because they respect him, they'll put the weapon down. But you see, they're livid with anger, and they are arguing. And my dad will listen and listen. And after he has allowed the man to tell the whole story, then he goes to the other man and he listens to him. And, and he was not a lawyer. He didn't train to be a lawyer or a judge of any. But he will listen. And then when they have all exhausted themselves, then he will ask them a question. Have you finished? <laughs> Have you finished? I remember all my brothers and sisters will remember that statement because even when we fight at home, that's what he would do. He will ask you, "Have you finished?" And then when you say, "We have finished," then he makes one or two sentences, and that ends the conflict. Now I still don't know how he does it, how he did it. I don't know. But that's what he did all the time. And this 
Easter, I was reflecting on that. And I was linking that to the statement that Jesus made on the cross. When he said, it is finished. But you want to understand that Jesus didn't just say it is finished. He actually allowed the devil to exhaust his arsenal. The, the, it, it, it is finished doesn't mean that now, it, it doesn't just mean you are now free, I have completed. Yes, it means it is complete, but it is finished also means everything that Satan has in his arsenal that he could use against humans, I have taken all of it. There is nothing else that he has that he can use. It is finished. In other words, I get a picture of God who did not interrupt the devil. <laughs> I get a picture of God who did not and who does not compete with the devil. And he says to the devil, bring out everything that you have. Unleash it on South Africa. Unleash it on Africa. Is there something else? Bring it out, bring it out, bring it out. Because I'm going to take it all. And only when you are exhausted, when there is nothing else in your asana, I will bring out the best. And I believe that God is bringing us beyond the hatred, beyond the bitterness, beyond the hostility, Beyond the misunderstanding, beyond the traps that we have set for the younger generation, where they cannot even walk together, I believe that God is bringing us into a season where His love can be shared abroad between Africans mm -hmm. and Caucasians. Can I get an amen? Amen. And in order for us to get to that season, I believe that we need to make a difference between the uh, uh, missionary Europe and colonial Europe. Now, many people still today do not see the difference. They just lump everybody together and say, you know, Europe came and they asked us to uh, to take the Bible, and when we closed our eyes and we were praying, then they stole the land. Now, uh, we need a new generation that can say that God sent Eru to give us the Bible so that we may know how to prosper in the land. We need a new generation to say that, to see that this manual called the Bible is an heritage and it's a labor. The missionaries labor to translate this book into our various languages. If we do not appreciate it, God has no reason to bless us for that. We have to demonstrate that we appreciate it. Now, on the left, those two pictures, on the left you see colonial Europe. You see the man smoking cigar, and you see him on the head of the Africans. That is still colonial Europe till tomorrow. Even the multinational companies that they've set up, it's to fulfill that purpose. But you see, the multinationals are undermining us and continue to dominate us because we have not appreciated the missionary Europe. You see, on the right, you see Europeans standing with Africans gleefully, joyfully, and, uh, you know, they are one. I want you to read a book uh, uh, out of Scotland. We have another Scottish missionary in our midst. But I want you to read the book written about Mary Slesso. I hear there are many books written about her. And I have read only one, Mary, the inexpendable uh, Mary Slessor. Now, one Scottish missionary changed the history 
of all the tribes in southeast of Nigeria. I will be honest with you. I know those tribes. I have worked there. I have ministered there extensively. These are tribes that used to, they were cannibals, and they killed human beings. And they killed twins until Mary Slessor came there as a mission. Now, Mary Slessor did not just fight that culture spiritually, she fought the cult. And she fought the men physically. You see, before she was recruited as a missionary, she was a street fighter on the street of, uh, of, 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 of Lisbon. And God used that to prepare her because occasionally she fought with these cult men to snatch the twins from their head. How can we pay for that? If Africa is asking Europe for reparation for colonization, my question as an African is, should God ask Africans to pay back the salaries of all the missionaries that he sent out of Europe? Will, will we be able to balance the, the sheet and uh, will, will the books balance? Because we Africans did not pay the salary of any of the missionaries that were sent to us. Hero paid for it. And many of them walked without payment. They gave their life. They gave their heart. And I do hope that that short presentation has touched your heart and that beyond the prayer that we could pray now, you will call your friends wherever they are and you will ask yourself what you can do for the missionaries whom God sent to you. Another lady went to the eastern part of Nigeria. Now, I don't know this story fully. My wife knows it very well. But we, we don't have much time. And this lady was responsible for running a home where lepers were, you know, where lepers were outcast and they were sent there. And she rescued many lepers from that community and uh, she became sick and went back to Europe. One day, this lady, after she had recovered, came to a congregation where some Africans were meeting in Europe. And she looked, she, she greeted somebody in the local vernacular. And they were surprised that she could speak Igbo. <laughs> and they wanted to know who she was. And she mentioned her name. The moment she mentioned her name, they remember, this is the lady who saved many lepers in our tribe. This is the lady who saved many outcasts. The people we didn't want to live with, this is the lady. And they started raising money worldwide among their people group to support this lady. And they gave it to her. Can we rise on our feet?